Halifax last night, Toronto's Harbourfront Reading Series played host to a lively double bill of performance poets, further proof of the growing public interest in the spoken word. Sherry D. Wilson from Vancouver describes herself as a feminine feminist, post-hippie, pre-generation X, mama of Dada. She was joined on the stage by legendary beat poet John Giorno. Giorno was an integral part of the 60s New York art scene. He had close relationships with Andy Warhol, Robert Mapplethorpe, Keith Haring, and William S. Burroughs. We asked him how he got started writing poetry. I started writing poetry when I was 14 years old with an assignment in school, and I got sort of a rush, you know? <laughs> and I really liked doing this. I think the teacher used it as an example, a small example. But you know how you, I had a visceral reaction, and I kept on doing it, on and on and on, and I was, prob I was a really bad poet then and for many years after. And then, and then my life really changed in the early 60s when I met Andy Warhol and all the pop artists. I thought to myself, they are doing really great things. And besides about Barbara Ashenberg and Jasper Johns, they were all relatively unknown. They just, I just had my karma happen to lead me to them. Then there is the reality of the family, your mother and father. Them and my mistakes is why I'm sitting at a table with a bunch of stupid jerks on Thanksgiving eating a turkey stuffed with lasagna. <laughs> I'm spending my whole life being with people I don't want to be with. I'm spending my whole life being with people I don't want to be with. I'm spending my whole life being with people I don't want to be with. I love completely perverted people. I come from the school of uh, no school um, I studied at Naropa, um, Boulder, Colorado. It's a Buddhist university, and um, it's a contemplative university. It's Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. And the idea is that you let the words and the sounds and the emotions come from your soul. And, um, and of course, you know, certain pieces are going to be read, and some certain pieces are not going to be read. There's a lot of stuff that I just don't read in public. Like, uh, I read a lot of my erotica pieces, but my erotica, 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 I, I don't read in public. Click on his perspective. His perspective. I'm watching you. I'm wanting to go there. Me f***ing you. I'm Jimi Hendrix. Between your sounds, hip lifting to probe, deeper, and enter, and enter, and in my closet, you, in my closet, and you're watching me, you're watching me, you're me, her, her, me, you, me, her, you, me, her, merge, merge, merge. Think dead hockey players. And another avenue that, that has come to is like all of the sort of guys from failed rock and roll bands. They'd be Jello Biafra and Henry Rollins and Lydia Lunch. Their bands failed, but they're still really good poets. They know how to perform. They know how to produce things in the studio, te te technology. They understand the media. They have the distribution of it. So that's another important venue. That, 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 so there's many, many, many that, that, that are now is coming to be called the, what is the revival or the of spoken word. It's the great fulfillment of poetry. <laughs> I'll bet a few people around here see Henry Rollins in his 60s and that guy. They hunt for the still smiling moon in all their dreams. Never despair, keep going, dream of pop stars every night. Crouched over your mother's toilet. Open mouth in silent anguish, but afraid to make a sound. Silence on the subway train. Not a movement. Just the deep humming of a fellow train nearby. When we all resume movement, the mood changes. Nobody said a word. Now nobody has to say a word. Just wait. It's happening all across North America in terms of people wanting to hear more of what people have to say, you know, straight up you to a microphone and to an audience. That's at number five. 
make sure to refer to every single black man as a lazy nigger. Now, I gotta tell you, this works especially well if you have a little black son. I mean, you gotta embed it. Don't let him forget it. And when he grows up, he can aspire to be a lazy nigger too. To have like, you know, three, four hundred people packed into a place like the Wiverly to hear poetry today, I think is a phenomenal thing, you know, and speaks to the power of the voice itself. If there's one thing you cannot and will not do is make the world a better place. If there's one thing you can't do is make this world a better place. If there's one thing you are not going to do is make the world a better place. Because you are only successful when you rip somebody off. I think it's not a resurgence, it's sort of a completion or a fulfillment because it's been going on since the early 1960s. Poets working with technology and media and performance and discovering their skills in performing. And it's gone on, many people have been doing it all these years. And for some reason now, many different avenues have come together. He was hot-headed. He blazed the night dark. He had a dream, and in this dream, he was a soldier in Jamaica. Unfortunately, the academic um, poetry scene, you know, the patched elbows with the pipes uh, poetry scene, uh, the, what do they call it now, the uh, academy poetry scene, uh, sort of took precedence for, for many, many years. But um, about six years ago in Vancouver, it started being seen more on a cabaret level. So poets were um, coming off the street and doing more street lingo, jazz, um, music-oriented poetry. Call me a dreamer. what I call dance poetry, which is that people can move to what I'm saying. I feel that that kind of deeper body understanding helps the mind in comprehending what's being said as well. I remember Spider-Man, too, taking on some octopus guy just out of jail and seeking revenge and all the stuff you could get from the back pages and sea monkeys and shit. And in the beats, people like, like Kerouac and Berlinghetti and, and Ginsburg and others they changed the approach to language. They, they made a, a street language appropriate and okay and brought it into the literature. Come on, boy, go thou across the ground. Go moan for man. Go moan. Go groan. Go groan alone. Go roll your bones alone. The rappers, I think, uh, are doing the same thing to another I don't know, generation. Broken glass everywhere. People pissing on the stage. You know they just don't care. I can't take the smell. Can't take the noise. Got no money to move out. I guess I got no choice. I see blood on what Malcolm has one shot up. I see tears because now it seems that we forgot up. I see the ears of people searching for solutions. Restitutions, excuses, no more, no more confusion. Rap is such a, has such a great art form. I mean, it's such a great, and it's so powerful, and the audience is there, and they've, they're, they've, they've developed it over the last decade into something miraculous. Rap has definitely not only informed the poets, but informed the populace in general about the power and the enjoyment of spoken word. It's brought the oral traditions back into a very contemporary sphere. We are all one race, the human race. What? My job? Well, you're not quite white for the job. I, I, I mean, right for the job, unless you mean affirmative action, Jackson. I look forward to hearing more and more and, and seeing more people, um, you know, get more venues and to spread the spoken word some more because it's nothing like, he like hearing people saying what they have to say. Let the African life be filled with strife, if that's what's right. For what value is life void of truth for the sake of betterment? What is development? Two four doors or one narrow door that opens one way. I believe that people want some sense of, of being a part of what's happening and that there are a lot of people out there who otherwise don't get something to say. So write the shit down, you know what I mean? Put it together, practice the shit at home and come out to a crowd like here and, and do it.